Hey, I, my head is swimming right now. I'll tell you, I have so many things that I want to share with you, so I'm going to try and uh, listen to Holy Spirit and just try and select out the things and emphasize what He wants me to say this morning. Um, oh, sorry, Dawn. Um, I want to start by talking about a couple um, vacations I took last summer, so 2013, and uh, the first was a, one of them was a trip to Haiti. And uh, George Fox University, where I go to school, they, they funded um, Stephanie and I to go there for six days, a six-day trip with a registered nurse from Florida who Stephanie knew, and we were going to visit an orphanage down there. And this man, Wilson, this registered nurse, I got to talk with him one night. And I'd been waiting because I just, I wanted to hear his story. I wanted to hear how, how this orphanage came about and where, where he got his, his passion for this from and, and what he was about. And so we're sitting down one night. It's like 9 o'clock, the end of a long day. And he stops to take a bite of food for me to ask my question, you know. So Wilson, tell me about this orphanage. The guy must have been hungry, but he put down his plate of food and he talked for about an hour and a half after that. He was just so passionate about, about this, this orphanage and this mission God had called him to. And I just, I just got to hear him share his heart um, for when he, sa- he told me about how he's watching TV and he saw pictures of the earthquake that had hit there. And he's from Haiti. He's Haitian himself. And so that's his hometown. And he saw this this little girl digging through the garbage looking for food, and God, God just put it on his heart to, to go back there. And his goal is to establish an orphanage where they can give kids, you know, beds and, and hot meals, three meals a day, he said. That's, that's what we are going to have here, and a medical clinic um, eventually. And, yeah, I just, I just saw it in his eyes. He said, Cody... As long as I am breathing, this will be a place that kids can call home. And I just thought that was so cool that he was doing that. And it made me think of uh, God's kingdom, which I'll, I'll be referring back to a little later, but that's, that's what my, I don't know if it says, th- yeah, the title. Children of the kingdom who think they are orphans. Um, and I'll, I'll explain what that means later on. But um, at the end of that trip in Haiti, I was sitting on, sitting on the roof of that orphanage there that, that Wilson had, and God showed up there. You know, I, I don't remember the last time I cried so hard. And it was, it was just because God broke my heart wide open for those, for those kids who were there. That I, that I got to spend time with and, and get to know. And also for all kids who feel unwanted. Because um, I just felt God's deep love for them. Because really the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. It belongs to little kids. That's what Jesus said, right? So uh, another experience is with wildlife. Newburgh Wildlife, uh, and this is a, um, a ministry that I've been doing in Newburgh. So uh, how many of you heard of Young Life? Anyone out? Yeah, okay. So Wildlife, uh, so Young Life is for high school students, and Wildlife is for, you might have guessed, middle school students. Yeah. So uh, this 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 ministry that God called me to through that's that's a whole another story how I got how I ended up getting involved in with them, but uh, there there was a summer camp that I went to that same summer that I went to Haiti. Uh, it was later on that summer, and uh, there were four guys four guys in our cabin, um, and a couple counselors from Portland who stayed with me and uh, this this uh, other seventh grader from Newburgh. And you know there were there were there were songs every day and there was a talk and games and it was super fun. Um, and this is actually the week they, they did a weekend camp 
called Winter Camp. So this is a just the weekend camp. It's like a preview of the summer camp that I went to last year. But while I was there, one of the, one of the one of the questions from from the message that you know we we're going to ask our kids in our cabins called cabin time, you know, is uh, what what can you take home with you, knowing more of God's love as you do. And I was amazed by what I heard. One of these one of these kids from Portland, we'll call him Kyle, um, told us. I was told us about how his his dad was in jail at the current time and he said I can take care of my mom and family while my dad is away. And th- this this middle schooler was concerned for the position of manhood his father had left and he wanted he just wanted to step into it for the sake of his family and so I mean, and we were asking about God's love. That's what we asked them about, and that's what he said. This this kid was in middle school. How could he know so much about God's love to say something like that? Here's the and here's the answer I've come up with is um, uh, middle school students. Um, they can seem to be bouncing off the walls 24-7 like they don't have any direction or know where they're going. But really, they, they are right on the brink of becoming men and women. They're right there. And I've seen it in instances like this with, 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 this, with Kyle at this camp. And it's, it's kind of been an ongoing revelation for me not to look at middle schoolers as, as kids. I've been, I've been really shying away from looking at them as kids because if, I mean, if you, if you, lo- if you see them as kids and call them kids, well, that's, that's how they're going to act like a majority of the time because that's how they're going to see themselves. But I think if you, when, when we look at young people and we call them up to a higher maturity than what they think they are, or what they've been told they are, then they, they rise to that occasion. Like, like, this, like this kid Kyle, when you just sit down and be real with him, this young man, Kyle. And... There was a span of time during that weekend where um, we were all going to go out, um, everyone, all the, count, all the counselors, all the kids, we're going to go off and be by ourselves for 10 minutes just to pray, just to be quiet and just to pray and just to hear God's voice. And that's, 10 minutes is actually a really long time for a middle schooler. <laughs> Trust me. So, but in that 10 minutes, um, there, there's this field out there, and I was just praying that, that the middle schoolers would have a God encounter, that they would, just that they would feel God's tangible love, and then next thing I know, I'm in the middle of this moonlit field bawling my eyes out again, because... <laughs> Because I, I felt God say to me, I love these middle schoolers so much. I want people to walk with them through life, loving them and telling them about me. And beyond a doubt, it was his way of telling me that Newburgh Wildlife was where God wanted me to be. That was early on in my ministry and that was a moment God used to speak to me. Tell me he wants me involved in these middle school students' lives. And here's why, here's why I love wildlife and young life and the ministry. Their mission is incarnation-oriented as opposed to event-oriented. And when I say that, I mean I grew up with the mentality that the way... 
to introduce your friends to Jesus was to invite them to church. Like that was that was the best way so that they can hear hear the message, you know, hear the message of Jesus Christ. And young life, wildlife is the opposite in a way, in a manner of speaking because what it's about is not inviting kids to club, what we call club, our kind of our youth group that we do every week. It's about going where the kids are, and I say kids as a cultural term, where the middle schoolers are, or the high schoolers, if you're in, if you're in young life, where they are, and building relationships with them. Entering their world where they are. And I say that, I repeat that phrase over and over again because it's come to mean so much more for me than just a physical location. Even though where they are, when I first started wildlife, where they are meant, okay, so I gotta go to the, I gotta go to the middle school. I, I'm gonna go to the basketball games. I'm gonna go to the football games, Friday night football games, hang out with middle schoolers because that's where they are. That's, this is where they are. So this is, this is what young life, okay, I'm gonna try this. See what, see what, see what happens. But it's come to mean so much more where they are isn't just about where they are physically, it's where they are spiritually, emotionally, socially. It's it's prompted me to do crazy things like watching YouTube videos that I don't necessarily think are cool or funny, but they love them, and that's where they are. Or listening to music that they love, Um, hit music and stuff. Because that's where they are. So that's where I'm going to go. And that was a huge revelation for me, too. And it's also really cool because that's what Jesus did. He moved into the neighborhood. Right? Where the people were. He moved in with them. He had dinner with them. He met them right where they were. That's why I think wildlife, young life is so effective, what, what we're doing. And that's why I think that's, that's evangelism. That's how we can share the gospel is first and foremost building relationships with people, meeting them where they are. And we can share the gospel with them from that relationship. Because we have Christ in us. Why not us? We don't, have, we don't have to bring them to church and let Pastor Don tell them about Jesus. We can introduce them to him because of our relationship. And then, you know, after that, after, you know, if there's a curiosity and, and later on, then, then yeah, bring them to church and if you see a curiosity, then yeah, they want to know more. Well, come to church. But maybe, maybe, maybe it could start with you. Build some relationship, meeting someone where they are, and telling them about Jesus. And maybe telling them about Jesus isn't even a verbal thing. Maybe you do it through your actions, the way you love that person. Because God shows us he loves us all kinds of ways. You can show people you love them all kinds of ways. And it it might eventually turn into something verbal where they ask, hey, why why do you you do all all these things? Why are you like this? Why do you you not do this? Bingo! (laughs) Gospel. So uh, I lost my place now. Got off on a little rant. (laughs) Um, <laughs> oh, thanks. So, um, oh, and from from doing this this type of ministry, the in, this incarnation ministry, um, I, I was able to see uh, kids give their life to Christ last summer at at the summer camp, the week long camp. Um, but it's also a joy, more of a joy, I think, for me is to witness them apply God in their daily life. Um, when we're talking after, 
after someone talks at club, after, after our youth group, um, there's this kid, Ruben, and uh, we asked something, uh, we asked something about who God is for them, something like, so how, how do you know who God is for you? And he said, and, and, this, and the, my fellow leader who was talking was talking about how God is our Heavenly Father and he loves us uh, more than we can ever imagine. And he said, uh, well, it, you know, we went around the circle, came to him. Well, my, uh, my parents are, are going through a, a divorce right now. And one of his friends goes, what? Yeah, I didn't know that. And uh, he says, yeah, and so I, I know, but, but I know that God, God's my father. He's my real father, my heavenly father, so he can, he can be there for me through this hard time. I'll say it again. This, this young man was <laughs> in middle school, and he's saying this. They get it. Young people get it. And uh, there was this there's this other kid, Seamus. I started helping out at the middle school in a science classroom. Tons of fun. Love that. They they one of their experiments when I first got there, they were they were doing these gummy bears and soaking them in solutions and seeing if they got bigger or smaller. Tons of fun, and uh, but when I first started out, there was this one kid who was kind of sitting off by himself uh, in the corner, while the teacher was giving out notes. You know, uh, kind of like important notes, like free credit. Just copy everything I'm writing down on your paper, and he was just sitting over there, kind of with his head down, not writing anything. Uh, so I just went over there and and asked him, you know, what was going on, and he said there was some. He said there was some kids bothering him and he just needed to move away and messing with his papers and stuff. But he went on to say, after I tried prompting him to copy the notes down, that he said, well, you know, I, I went to another middle school and I'm just, I'm just a failure. You know, I failed over there and failed all my classes and I, I tried really hard and I did all my work and I... I'm over here now, and I'm on the line. If I miss another day of school, you know, I'm going to be in big trouble. And I, I'm really sick. I was puking this morning and last night. I can't miss, couldn't miss school, though, because I'm really close to the line. And I, I, I just, there's no point. I'm, I'm going to fail this class, too. But I was able to look at him and tell him that he, that tell him I thought he could do it. Tell him I thought he could pass this class. I said, no, I think you can, I think you can do it. Just copy notes down. And so he eventually got his notes out and he started scribbling really fast, you know, filling in all these boxes and checks and everything. I'm going, oh, okay, he's just trying to get me off his back here, filling in random stuff on his worksheet, and he finishes. So I say, all right, let's see. Let's see how you did, what you got here. And I'm looking at this, kind of reading, skimming the directions, and just my glasses, my invisible glasses, my contacts. I don't wear contacts. <laughs> I thought I needed them at that moment because all the answers on the sheet were right. Everything he had filled in in 10 seconds was all the right answers. What does that mean? This, this guy was smart. He knew exactly what he was doing. He just didn't think he was. He didn't see himself that way. He saw himself as a failure. Whether it was because of things going on at home or what friends had told him or teachers had told him or things that he'd experienced, but that was his view of himself. 
No, I'm a failure. But he wasn't. That really shook me up. It, it, not only was it not true, it was the complete opposite of the truth. Because he was really smart. He knew all the answers. And being able to just offer a little word of encouragement and see what came out of that, it's, it's really been like God's teaching me about, you know, proclamation and speaking life into people's lives. If you ever get the chance, Toby Mack wrote this song called Speak Life. And he just came out with a new music video. And it kind of relates directly to this story. Um, look it up on YouTube. It's, it's a phenomenal video, but it's, it's basically just saying, hey, words, words can tear us down, they can destroy, they can kill us, or resurrect us, they give us life. Rekindle passions and dreams and truths about ourselves that are already there, just don't know about them. And that's why, that's why this title, Children of the Kingdom Who Think They Are Orphans. It's not the truth. They're not orphans. They're children of the Most High King. A lot of them don't know it, though. A lot of them don't know that. My last kind of story is um, before we went to Haiti, so my timeline's bouncing all over. See me after if you want to get it straightened out. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, before I went to Haiti, um, I, was in a, I was in Florida with Stephanie, seeing her family, and, and we were at her church, and um, they, had, they do this thing called Night Watch on Friday nights, just like free worship and and prayer, and whatever you, whatever you want to do to connect with God, and um, as I was, as I was sitting there, my thoughts were drifting to my wildlife kids back home, and end of the, end of the kids in Haiti, the orphans who I would, who I'd be meeting, just, just kids in general who come from broken homes, uh, whether or not their parents are divorced, no families are perfect, you don't have to come from a divorced family to come from a broken home necessarily. But um, whether or not, so once again, once again, whatever I was singing uh, was interrupted by sobbing. I couldn't even sing anymore because I just felt heavy. I felt, I felt heavy. I felt sad, just s heavy sadness for the faces of those kids that were flashing through my mind that I knew from back home. And and I just thought, man, they deserve better. And I, I prayed this. I said, God, your kingdom should have no room for this. I prayed, no child should ever have a reason to question their worthiness of unconditional love. Their parents are supposed to be that for them. And so I, I next prayed for a double portion of love for those kids and that out of what was broken, they would come to know their Heavenly Father's love on an unshakable level. And as soon as I said that, uh, I didn't even really believe my own prayer. I didn't even really believe what I was saying at first. And it was at that moment after I'd said that, though, they were kind of, the worship team was kind of in an interlude and someone on the team started singing Spirit of Adoption. Weren't the words to the song. <laughs> Spirit of Adoption. It was more of a chant than, a, than an actual singing. It was like, Spirit of Adoption. It's like a chant. Just started after I, after I prayed that and I just, something, something new filled my heart to replace the sadness for, that was there, a warmth. And, and a new, a revelation unfolded before me then. God is adopting these kids into the kingdom. And there, 
They will know the perfect love, perfect love of a father they may never have had. But regardless, the perfect love of a father who's there for them all the time, who wants to know them. That's what God's doing. And something I want to tell you guys this morning is that the orphans, they're coming. And this isn't my idea either. This is, this is a Bethel speaker, Bob Johnson, but I feel I, I needed to pass it on to you guys today because the orphans are coming. Some of them are already here. Others are on their way. But they're coming. They're coming. And what do I mean when I say orphan? I don't, I don't just mean, I don't just mean, I don't just mean kids who don't have a dad or a mom. Or I don't, and I don't just mean kids whose parents are divorced and still live together or anything like that. What I mean when I say orphan, when I say the orphans are coming, the orphans I'm talking about are any kid who doesn't know how deep and how wide and how great their Heavenly Father's love for them is. That's who the orphans are. It's not that they are orphans. The truth isn't that they're orphans. It's that they think they're orphans. And they're coming. All these young people who think they're orphans, they're coming, and they're here. And the second thing I want to tell you guys is God's spirit of adoption is at work. And I'll tell you, it's, it's such a joy. It really is such a joy to be a part of that. <coughs> to be a part of God's spirit of adoption here. And in bringing God's kingdom here and now. So many, so many stories I, I could share with you if I had time of God's spirit of adoption where I've seen that. Um, but uh, I want to talk about my Argentina trip now last is so George Fox University does a summer serve trips every year they send teams to two locations and it's Romania and Argentina this year so I'm going to Argentina and it's in partnership with an organization called Word Made Flesh Incarnation what these guys do is they move into the neighborhood and they build relationships with the poor and marginalized people of society, wherever they are. And so that's, that's what I will be doing. The, their mission statement for Argentina, uh, the official one, is that they exist to serve and discover Jesus among the abandoned and vulnerable youth on the streets of Buenos Aires. I'm excited. Now, we won't have a physical structure necessarily to show for our efforts down there like the Mexico teams may have, but that doesn't mean we won't be building. We're going to be building God's kingdom down there by building relationships with, with the young people we come in contact with. And the cool thing is that even when we're gone, and hopefully we will have Facebook and inter some kind of connection, but the Word Made Flesh people who are already there will be able to continue to build off of what we're hoping to contribute. And I'm also, I'm also excited for what I'm going to learn. I feel like there's so much more I'm going to be actually taking in than, than pouring out. And... So I, I, my hope this morning is you all just be encouraged by the work that God is doing in the world and that you're challenged by the, by, the, by the orphans that are here and that are coming, by the kids who think they're orphans, the ones who don't know the love of their Heavenly Father. Uh, so, 
for this trip, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for partnerships, really, um, with you guys, with anyone who wants to partner with me. And so I need uh, partners in prayer. Uh, just be praying that we, we have a kingdom awareness while we're there to see things that to see things from a heavenly perspective and courage to act on the Spirit's leading and ears to hear the Spirit while we're there and um, advocacy partners, you know, just telling other people um, about my trip, which could, which could come in handy. We have, we're having a banquet, actually, this coming Saturday, and so I do have tickets. That, um, we're, we all need to sell seven, seven tickets, everyone on the team, and the profit from those goes right right into our own funds. So if, you wanna, if you're interested and want to buy tickets to, to the banquet we're having, which is like an info kind of thing, then see me after. That would, be, that would be cool. And so financial support is, all, is a, th- a third kind that I'm seeking. Now, I, I was looking at my notes here. These, these are a lot of the same notes that I used when I spoke at Free Methodist about a month and a half ago. And when I spoke there, it was in February, about the middle of February. I I'd, I'd raised $800 at that point out of my 3600 total. And today, I, I have, I'm up to $2,900. I've just been, I tell you guys, I've been blown away by God's provision, by His pouring out in this area. I've been blown away. I had a, seriously, one of my friends that I do a Bible study with at college, so he's a college student, not really much better off than me financially. He gives me, he gives me an envelope with money after our Bible study. He says, here, Cody, I, I wanted to give to you a trip. Just felt like, a, like I needed to give. I got home and I opened up the envelope, and there were two $50 bills in the envelope. I was so humbled. I was, and I've, I've continued to be humbled and so, so blessed by all, all the donations I've received, all the people God has used to, to help fund this trip. And so I still have, I still have another $700 to raise by, I'm trying to raise it all by the end of this month. Um, and the official cutoff is mid-August when they really want it all in. But I'd, I'd like to have it. My, my vision starting out was to have it all raised before I actually left. So that's, that's my goal. Because um, I, don't, I don't think any of us should do ministry alone. Um, it's a church effort. That's kind of why I'm here telling you guys about it. Um, I don't just want it to be an isolated isolated ministry, and and here's my heart overall, is that Jesus said, go, and that's what I want to do, whether it's, you know, whether it's going to Argentina or Mexico or some other country far away on a serve trip, or whether it's going to the middle school cafeteria or high school basketball game. I just want to follow that call to go, to go out, meet people where they are. And if, if you're a young person here today, uh, I want to tell you that you are never alone. And I want to tell you that because it's so easy to feel like you are especially in middle school, especially in high school. It's so easy to feel like you're alone at times. You're not. You're never alone. God's always there for you. And I can pretty much guarantee you there's people in this church who, who would be there for you and love to, love to share any, with any, and if you have any questions, they'd love to talk with you about things. But you're never alone and we sang a song earlier this morning, How Great Thou Art. And I'll tell you, when, when I was singing that, I thought, of, I thought of you guys, all you young people in the room. 
because that song is about you. I don't know if you knew that. How great thou art is about you guys. Because each one of you is a work of art. You're a masterpiece. You're perfect just the way you are. God created you that way. That song's about you guys. You're a great work of art. And the last thing, all you young people, keep searching. Because you're never going to arrive where you have all the answers about God and who God is. In fact, there's going to be times you're going to fall flat on your face and everything you thought you knew about God is going to be completely backwards from what you thought. Keep searching. Keep seeking God. Keep trying to find out who he is, who he is in your life, and what he wants to do in your life. And the Bible says, if you seek me, I'll be found by you. So, there's your guarantee right there. If you find yourself completely in the dark, you don't know where God is or who he is anymore, keep searching and he'll find you. So I uh, just have a video I wanted to show you guys about my time in, in Haiti and, and summer camp uh, last, last summer, so, and I'll be around after the service to, to talk with anyone who wants to. So, thank you. We met half a dozen times Know your name, I know you don't know mine But I won't hold that against you You come here every Friday night I take your order and try to be polite what I've been going through if you looked me right in the eye would you see the pain deep inside would you take the time
in the morning.